afternoon, welcome back. Today we have a quasi new lecture. Uh, I always gave an HIV AIDS lecture in this course. The only one, the only virus to get its own lecture. This is a process driven course, right? We don't talk about viruses, but the HIV AIDS pandemic is a big deal, continues to be. So I thought it always warranted a lecture. And now we have COVID-19, which doesn't warrant its own yet. And why? We don't know enough. You'll see, we know so much about HIV AIDS and maybe one day COVID will get its own lecture, but not yet. So let's see how this goes. This is mostly HIV AIDS, but I wanted to put them together to be able to compare uh, origins, the kinds of disease, the transmission, and so forth. So a tale of two pandemics. So what is a pandemic to begin with? Oh, do I have arguments with my colleagues about this? Uh, because it's not really a scientific, it's not a virological definition. It's not about immunity, it's not about disease severity. None of those play into the original definition of a pandemic. It's an epidemic occurring worldwide that affects how we live, work, or play. That's it. And the WHO is the organization who decides when something is a pandemic or not. And the reason they do so is so that countries get a message. There's gonna be some th shit hitting the fan soon and you better be prepared. You better mobilize whatever it takes to, to take care of this. That's really the main driver. And then when the pandemic is over, they stop. Now, they haven't said that it's over yet because in the world, there's certain countries that are still affected in this way. I think in the US, uh, it's no longer affecting how we live, work, and play. We are here without masks. We are going to, to classes. We're going to theaters, sporting events, restaurants, everything, trains, subways. We have vaccines, we have natural immunity. And you can argue with me about all of those things. I'll be happy to argue with you about it, but basically in the US, it is over. But let's start with the AIDS pandemic, which uh, there is a wonderful book if you would like to have some summer reading by Jacques Pepin, The Origin of AIDS, really, really good. And he, this is a quote from the book. This tragedy, the AIDS pandemic, was facilitated or even caused by human interventions, colonization, urbanization, and probably well-intentioned public health campaigns. So we will get into that in a moment. First report in MMWR, June 5th, 1981, cases of pneumocystis pneumonia in Los Angeles. Five young men, all homosexuals, treated for biopsy confirmed pneumocystis carinii. This is something that never infects or rarely infects healthy people. So the authors you see say here, it's almost exclusively limited to ex severely immunosuppressed patients. And these authors, uh, suggest the possibility of a cellular immune dysfunction relating to some common exposure that these individuals had. They weren't uh, clear um, what it was at that time. And on the right in New York City, Ari Rubenstein, a pediatric immunologist at Albert Einstein in the Bronx, he treats five black infants who are showing signs of severe immune deficiency including pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP. At least three are children of women who use drugs and engage in sex work. He recognizes that they're showing some of the same illnesses that affect the gay men, but his colleagues say he's full of it. They, die, they dismiss him. Typical that you need to have somebody out of the box to get things going. So for years, this was called a gay disease. In fact, for many years, it was called GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency. Another failure of public health in this country to not recognize from the start that it was transmitted in other ways as well. And uh, I, I'm just ashamed that we continue to have this MPOX assumed to be a, a gay disease as well for quite a while. I just don't understand why we don't learn uh, lessons. So the CDC, after these early reports, establishes a tentative uh, definition of AIDS acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, as I see here, formerly GRID. They changed that a, a year later. 
clusters of pneumocystis carinae and Kaposi's sarcoma, a kind of cancer which you can see has uh, skin lesions associated with it, but there are also internal tumors associated with Kaposi's sarcoma. So Kaposi's sarcoma or opportunistic infections, uh, and uh, subsequently we found, of course, that this infection was transmitted at birth, it was transmitted among heterosexuals and also by blood products. There are many people who need packed red cells, right? They, need, they, they have hemophilia, for example, and those packed red cells yeah, that you, most of them come, came at this time from Haiti, where they paid people to give blood, and many of them were HIV infected. The blood industry denied that there was a problem. They said, no, we don't have to check our blood, and they kept giving people this contaminated blood, and they induced many, many cases of uh, AIDS in people who had no other risk factors other than they got blood. So HIV was subsequently found to be the, vi the causative agent of uh, AIDS was found to be a retrovirus, in particular a lentivirus. It was isolated, the virus isolated in 1983 from the lymph node of a patient with lymphadenopathy, swollen lymph nodes, because that's where the virus is reproducing. Uh, in Paris, uh, Montagnier and Barry C. Nussi got the Nobel Prize for that in 2008. So having the virus, now you can make a blood test and uh, this turned out to be a lentivirus, which is a known group of retroviruses. Just to remind you, the retroviruses are a family of viruses that encode reverse transcriptase. And we have talked in this course about avian leukosis virus, Rouse sarcoma virus, walleye dermal sarcoma virus. So this is a, another um, genus within the retroviridae, the lentiviruses, which, which include HIV-1 and 2. There was a second one subsequently discovered. So these, um, there are two evolutionarily distinct groups of human retroviruses. We have the lymphotropic viruses, HTLV-1, 2, 3, 4, which we're not going to talk much about, but uh, cause important diseases on their own. So they're lymphotropic. Uh, they, they have a tropism for lymphoid cells. And then the immunodeficiency virus, HSIV 1 and 2, they are lentiviruses. They're not unique to humans. We know for many years equine infectious anemia virus, for example, uh, causes immunodeficiency of horses, an immunosuppressive infection, much like uh, AIDS. Uh, both, there are bovine, feline, caprine immunodeficiency viruses. So when we isolated the virus, we saw the symptoms in patients. Many retroviruses immediately said, aha, this is an immunosuppressive infection because we know it from having studied it in other animals as well. The genome of HIV-1 and 2 are typical retroviral genomes. They're shown here as the proviral structure with the LTRs at either end, and then the coding region in the middle. The provirus, remember, is the integrated DNA. So we have gag, pole, and envelope coding regions. But in addition, lots of coding regions for smaller accessory proteins that have a variety of functions that we've talked about at different times uh, in this course. This is an envelope virus, of course. The glycoproteins are very sparse in the envelope, as you can see here. There is a nucleocapsid within the envelope, which contains two copies of the viral RNA, and then proteins like reverse transcriptase, uh, integrase, and protease. So HIV and AIDS. AIDS, of course, is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, a syndrome is the occurrence together of a pattern of symptoms or a group of symptoms. Uh, and you often, you often uh, define that before you know the etiologic agent. In this case, we found out that HIV-1 is the agent of epidemic AIDS. There are still, to this day, AIDS denialists who say uh, H, no one has ever proven that HIV-1 causes AIDS. I don't know why they're wasting their breath saying these things has been tested by giving people contaminated blood, they get, H they get AIDS. There's no question that uh, this virus causes AIDS. Many denialists refuse to be treated and many of them have died. I get emails on a daily basis. Professor, can you show me evidence that HIV is a real virus? 
Okay, let's look at some numbers just to put this in perspective. In the U.S., there are over 600,000 deaths from HIV-1, which exceeds all combat-related deaths. In all the wars we fought in the 20th century, 1.14 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV infection. One in seven people don't know it. That's a problem because they will transmit it. Uh, in 2019, this is the last year we had reliable numbers. Uh, 36,000 new infections, 69% of them in men who have sex with men, MSM, 23% uh, heterosexual, 7% intravenous drug use. And so on the left is the breakdown by age. You see the most number of infections are in the 25 to 34 year old group. And on the right is um, characteristics of the individuals, the most numbers are in men who have sex with men, black, African-American, then we have MSM, Hispanic, Latino, uh, then we have M, just uh, uh, white male to male sexual contact. Below that we have uh, black, African-American women, heterosexual contact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are the global numbers. 37.7 million people currently are living with AIDS. 680,000 people died in 2020. Yeah, this is an ongoing pandemic. It's changing people's lives still. Uh, we have 4,600 new infections a day, 190 per hour. So in the course of this lecture, we're gonna have over 190 new HIV infections. And uh, so this is the breakdown um, by age, total adults, women, men, and children. The children are inadvertent recipients, right? They're born because their mother is infected and they have no, they have no say in the matter. And a lot of those uh, numbers there and a lot of them die as well. And here it's broken down by WHO region. You know, the WHO recognizes the world divided into regions. Uh, we have uh, you know, East and Southern Africa, Western and Central Africa, Asia, Pacific, et cetera. And you can see the vast burden of, of uh, AIDS, 20 million plus in East and Southern Africa and much fewer in other places. Why so many in East and Southern Africa? As you'll see, that's where it started. It's had the longest time to transmit there and they have the least medical treatment because uh, they don't have a lot of money. This is distribution by population groups. 35% is the most, but that's everybody except sex workers, people who use drugs, men who have sex with men, transgenders, and clients of sex workers and sex partners of others. So uh, those are the other, the remaining that don't fit into those are the, the vast majority of people who are newly infected. Now, as we talked about, before, we can control infection. We have tripled up drug therapy, uh, which can control it. But as you know, this doesn't cure an infection. It uh, can't clear the virus because, as you will see, the provirus integrates into long-lived memory T cells that do not go away on their own. And you can take all the drugs you want. The viral DNA will still be in those cells. There's no vaccine, so we can't block primary infection. I don't know if we'll ever have one. So many have failed. So many vaccine trials have failed. So you have to take drugs the rest of your life. Every day you have to take triple drug, drug therapy. Resistant viruses occasionally arise. Uh, these drugs are expensive, of course, and so that's why many company, uh, countries do not have them. So where did it come from? It came from Africa. The first studies in Africa, once we had reagents provided by having the virus and cloned viral DNA, uh, showed in Zaire and Rwanda, shown by the red arrows there. AIDS was common in the capitals of those countries where over 90% of sex workers were infected by doing serological surveys. This is in the 1980s. And then we tested archival samples. We take serum that's been stored for many years and ask, does it have HIV-1 uh, uh, DNA? Well, RNA de determined by RT-PCR. And that showed that uh, HIV was present in the 1960s and 70s in multiple places in Central Africa, but not West Africa or East Africa. Um, and again, this, we first pick it up in the US in 1981, right? So this is much earlier. 1959 serum sample from an adult DRC male was found positive in 1998. And a lymph node sample from a DRC female in 1960 was also found positive. And so from that, we could do uh, molecular clock calculations. 
these two viruses from 1960 and 1959 differ by 12% genome sequence. So we can make a molecular clock for calculating how much it's changing per year. And eventually that'll play into where, when we think this arose, and I'll get to that in a moment, but it was no, no question that this virus was present by 1959 to 60 in Leopoldville, which used to be the name of the capital DRC. Now it's Kinshasa, of course. Okay, so what's the source of the virus? Where did it come from? So Beatrice Hahn, shown here in my wall of polio in my lab years ago when it was a freestanding wall. Too bad none of you could visit it because I don't have my office anymore, but it's, I left it behind because I didn't feel like throwing it out. This is 1,600 plates of six well plates of a plaque assay. So that's Beatrice Hahn who did a study in Africa. She sampled chimpanzees uh, extensively, over 7,000 chimpanzee fecal and urine samples. So it turns out chimps sleep up in the tree canopy, right in the trees, and in the morning they get up. What's the first thing they do? Just the same thing you do when you first get up. They pee. And, well, maybe you don't because you're young, you know, but they pee and they pee down into the floor. They just, and then people go out and capture the pee and you can find HIV in it. But they can also find feces on the forest floor. Forest floor. And then you can do mitochondrial DNA sequencing to know which chimp it is. It's Betty or John or whatever, because they give them all names. Anyway, they found SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, in some of these, and in particular, only two species, Pantroglodytes, Troglodytes, and PT Schweinfurthi. Those are the ones in yellow. Only those harbor SIV CPZ, which as you will see, was the precursor for um, HIV-1. And this virus is transmitted among chimps by sexual intercourse, by mother to child at birth. Probably they fight, chimps fight, and they bleed, and they probably also spread it that way. The transmission probability per coital act is about 0.008 to 0.0015, which is similar to humans. You know, you have a 0.0011 chance of contracting HIV AIDS from a contaminated person um, per sex act, but that doesn't mean you need to do it a thousand times to get it. It could happen the first time, okay? P students have asked me this before. So I can have a thousand sex acts before I will get infected. No, no, that's not what that number means. That's a, that's a risk factor. Um, and this virus is pathogenic in chimps. It causes immunosuppressive disease. And so by sequencing the genomes of SIV, CPZ, and uh, HIV-1, you could clearly see they have a common ancestor. Here is the gag pole and envelope genes, and we have HIV here, um, uh, and um, here we have, uh, let's see, uh, SIV, CPZ is the ancestor of HIV-M. M is the main group of HIV-1. And then there are other groups, N and uh, P and O, and they all arose from SIV, either from chimps or from gorillas. And this is substantiated by the same analysis for the Paul gene uh, and the envelope gene. So uh, what's going on here? Okay, there are uh, old world monkeys living in Africa, many different species, monas, red caps, mandrills, et cetera, vervets, bunch of them, each of them has their own SIV. It's distinct, and they've lived with it for thousands of years. These animals do not get sick from it. They've coexisted it for years. And those SIVs have names like SIV Mon, stands for Mona Monkey, SIV RCM, Red Capped Mangabe. Okay, so the, um, the, ch the virus that chimps have, SIV CPZ, which Beatrice Hahn found in many chimps in specific places, that is a recombinant between uh, SIV Mona and SIV RCM. The chimps got it a few hundred years ago and they passed it on to people and uh, that gave rise to two groups of HIV, M and N. M is the most number of infections, N is more rare. There are two other groups of HIV, P and O. Those came from a gorilla or gorillas, different separate spillovers. The, the gorilla got it from chimps. So how do these animals pass these viruses? Well, here's a chimp eating the, the leg of a monkey, a, uh, an old world monkey. So, you know, they, 
they fight, these guys don't just eat plants, they can eat meat. And so probably a chimp sometime got these viruses from two monkeys and they recombined and formed SIV CPZ. And then the chimp passed it on to humans. I'll talk about how in a moment. Chimp passed it to a gorilla at some point and it became uh, SIV gore and that was passed to humans. So four separate spillovers. M, N, O, and P, four separate spillovers, different times, two from chimps, two from gorillas to humans. That gave rise to the HIV pandemic. When did this happen? M and O, the first three decades of the 20th century, uh, N and P more recently, but we don't have enough data to, put, to pin it down. So I'm saying about 1920, okay, just to make a nice date instead of saying the first three decades. Because we go to 1900s and 1930, we'll just pick 1920 in between. So the way it gets into people is by bushmeat hunting. People are hunting for chimps uh, in the forest. Someone catches one, they go to dress it, they cut themselves, they get some blood or, or, or mucous membrane fluid uh, into them and they get uh, infected. And some calculations have been done, which are in that book, The Origin of AIDS, suggests that in 1921, the number of people who got infected with SIV CPZ was probably less than 10. Many people are hunting, but just by the calculations, less than 10, and only one of them spread the M group and multiplied. And they, these spillovers have prob probably happened many times since then, and they're probably still happening from chimp to humans because there's still bushmeat hunting going on, but only these spread. In fact, the M1 is the big one. So why did that one spread? Because cities became established and grew uh, in, uh, in Africa. There's a picture, several series of pictures of Kinshasa, the capital which used to be called Leopoldville of DRC. And you can see it starts off in 1883 as just a few huts. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now in 1955, it's a big city. There's a main river there that can bring people from other regions. And on the right is the population group uh, growth uh, in um, a lot of major cities in Africa. Here's Kinshasa here. Very low population until the 1920s. And the, the population goes up. And this gray area, that's about when we think HIV-1 went into people. And so what's going on here? Well, the European countries are all grabbing pieces of Africa and they are building bridges and towns and railroads. They are transferring men from the villages they live in into the cities. They build brothels for them to keep them entertained. And so this hunter who cut himself or herself in a forest comes to a city and visits a brothel he gets a sexually transmitted disease. Then he goes to a clinic that have been set up by the same European countries to um, take care of these individuals and they don't sterilize their needles. So they facilitate the amplification. So uh, this is what we think happens. And uh, in the 1960s, the Belgian Congo, which had been colonized by Belgians, they got tired of the Belgians, they kicked them out. They revolted and they, they're back to the Congo. And, the problem was the Belgians were the doctors. So what did they do? Well, Belgian Congo was a French speaking country. So they reached out to Haiti and they got doctors to come and take care of them. So what do you think happened? The doctors, some of the doctors got HIV AIDS and they went back to Haiti and they brought it there. Haiti was a vacation destination spot for Americans. That's how it got into the US. So this is the series of events. And so European colonization of Africa is really important. Establishing large population centers, prostitution, healthcare using unsterile needles. And just to show you that using unsterile needles is, an, is a thing, Egypt at the turn of the 20th century wanted to get rid of schistosomiasis. So they injected people with a drug. They didn't sterilize the needles. They made Egypt the highest infected country in the world with hepatitis C virus as doing that. So we think all of these things led to large scale amplification of HIV-1. More recently, Michael Warby and colleagues have studied archival isolates of HIV, of serum from uh, the US, and they have established this uh, timeline of importation. So Haiti, the virus arrives in Haiti, say around 1969 after the, the Belgian Congo 
kicked out the Belgians and brought doctors in from Haiti. It then goes to New York around 1972. And you can get these numbers by sequencing isolates from these different times. It goes from New York to California. Uh, it goes from New York to Georgia and spreads elsewhere, of course. But here's the phylogenetic tree of isolates from all these individuals. You can see the Haitian isolate is at the root of the whole tree. It's the ancestor to all these viruses. And then we have isolates in New York City and so forth. Now, if you've ever had heard of Gaetan Dugas, maybe some of you have, he was a flight attendant who was proud that he had sex with thousands and thousands of men and people used to call him patient zero. No, he wasn't patient zero. There he is, patient zero. He's just another branch uh, on the tree here. Uh, patient zero was way back when in Africa, obviously. So now we have four groups of HIV, right? Uh, M, N, O, and P from four separate spillovers, two from chimps, two from gorillas. And they're based on sequence alignment. Uh, group M, 99% of all infections. It's further divided into subtypes, as you can see here, which have sequence differences. There's just so many of them and so, much, so many infections that they further diversify uh, and they're put into subtypes. And subtypes can have geographical distributions. Uh, group O, O stands for outlier, less than 1% of infections. It's limited to Cameroon, Gabon, and some neighboring countries. Group N, there have only been 13 cases documented, and group P, just two, both in Cameroon. And again, each of these is from an independent transmission event of SIV, either SIV from chimps or SIV from gorillas to humans. The SIV was originally in the old world monkeys. They did not go directly to people. They went to chimps and then uh, gorillas. We also have HIV-2, which was subsequently discovered uh, first in Guinea-Bissau, over here on the west coast of Africa. It's restricted primarily to populations on the west coast. It is less virulent. Most of the infections don't progress to AIDS, which you'll see in a moment is an immunosuppressive state. It's less transmissible, and there's no mother to infant spread. So where's this from? This is eight distinct spillovers from sooty mangabees to people. So no chimp or gorilla intermediates. People, many people keep sooty mangabees as pets. They're just captured. So they're infected with their sooty mangabee SIV. And eight times the virus from a sooty mangabee has uh, spilled over into people and then they have transmitted it. But a much, much less severe uh, disease. Uh, so there we have there, sooty mangabe, uh, SIV, SMM, going into people to establish uh, eight lineages of HIV-2. Now you may be wondering, what's the SIV MAC? Macaques are not infected, but they're, they're often worked on in U.S. laboratories. And they're often injected with serum from people to do various experiments. They were inadvertently infected with Sudi Mangabe SIV a while ago. So now there's an SIV MAC as a consequence of that. How is it transmitted? Sex, intravenous drug use at birth. Uh, the the, the uh, reproductive index, index is about two to five. No respiratory transmission, no fecal oral transmission, no mosquitoes, no house flies, none of that. It's just those. And if you look at the uh, transmission modes in different regions, they're different. So West and Central Europe, North America, 57% MSM, whereas in Eastern uh, Europe and Central Asia, mostly injecting drug users. And the transmission mother to child at birth is about 5% uh, of, of all of this, of these numbers. The virus is not very stable. So it's air drying will, will reduce its infectivity, heating, bleach, extremes of pH. But of course, it doesn't matter because this is, the virus is delivered right into the host, either by sex or intravenous drug use. So it doesn't have to be stable. And it's also uh, spread, of course, in monkeys, not by drug use, of course, but by uh, sex and fighting and so forth. So it doesn't need to be stable. So here are some risks of transmission. Um, and again, this, don't use this as a guide, okay? You, you need to protect yourself, uh, and um, there, there's pre-exposure prophylaxis if you wanna take drugs before you have a risky encounter, and those reduce uh, 
infection quite a bit. So the mode sexual transmission, you can see that's the infection risk for 10,000 exposures. Receptive anal sex, 138. Insertive anal sex, 11. Penile vaginal sex, receptive, 8. Insertive, 4, and so forth. Parenteral, giving someone infected blood as a transfusion, almost 100%. You put a lot of virus in someone, they're going to get infected, 9,250 out of 10,000. Needle sharing, 63. Needle sticks that you would get in a hospital, 23 out of 10,000. But if you get a needle stick and you know that it was from a patient with uh, HIV AIDS. You can get antivirals, and then it reduces it to, uh, to one. And then the mother to infant, without um, AZT treatment, these are older numbers, of course, because we don't use AZT anymore, uh, 2260 out of 10,000 births, and uh, with AZT, less than 1,000. So you give the mother a dose of, of uh, you find out if she is positive, you treat her with antiretrovirals just before birth to bring down the viral load and you reduce the infection of the infant. Now, you know, in places where there's not much health care, you can't do this. And that's part of the issue. That's why we still have a lot of uh, childhood cases arising. So how does the infection work? Primary mm -hmm. infection at a mucosal surface typically, or if you put the virus right into the blood, it bypasses the mucosa, but the, muco the virus here is crossing the mucosal barrier. Uh, it is picked up by dendritic cells. So dendritic cells have a protein on them called DC sign to which the virus attaches. It doesn't get into the dendritic cells, it just sticks to their surface. And then that, that dendritic cell typically goes to a lymph node. And what's in the lymph node? Lots of CD4 positive T cells, uh, which are where the virus is reproducing. The virus can also infect CD4 T cells that are not in lymph nodes that are just floating around the tissues, of course. Uh, the virus reproduces in the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes, of course, drain into the blood eventually, and that brings the virus to all sorts of tissues. You get a viremia spread to other lymphoid tissues, uh, and eventually the immune response kicks in, and you downregulate virus multiplication, but it keeps going on for many, many years. About six months after exposure, you reach what we call a viral set point, which is a low level of virus production that continues for many years without drug treatment, of course. And so here's the progression of HIV infection. We have the acute phase. So it starts off as a typical acute virus infection. You get exposed. Uh, here on the top is viral RNA in the blood. So you have a peak of viral RNA production. Uh, you have a slight decrease in the number of CD4 positive T cells. Of course, that's the main reproductive site for the virus, CD4 positive T cells. Uh, and then after five to 10 weeks, uh, the viral RNA declines, and then you reach a set point very low virus replication or low virus replication uh, for many, many years. You see the scale on that is years uh, after HIV infection. And again, this is untreated because if we treat, we have a very different picture. Now in the acute phase, you can have some symptoms, swollen lymph nodes, lymph adenopathy, which was what the CDC was first looking for, fever, diarrhea. Um, and then we enter the chronic phase where you can see, again, uh, a low constant uh, level of viremia, but occasionally bursts of higher levels. And here you can have you can have either no symptoms or sporadically fatigue, mild weight loss, lymphadenopathy, rash, shingles. And here, the CD4 positive T cells are gradually declining. That's the red here, right? They're going lower and lower and lower and lower. Um, and um, Eventually, you reach the, the, the phase of AIDS, which is dis defined by how many CD4 positive T cells per milliliter of blood you have. And you see here, two to 500, which is very, very low here. You, and you can have a whole slew of other infections that you cannot clear now because you're destroying CD4 T cells. You know those are helper T cells. You need them to make antibodies and cytotoxic T lymphocytes. You can see um, oral and skin lesions, genital warts, Kaposi's sarcoma, tuberculosis. Then when you go below 200 CD4 
can cells per mil, opportunistic infections by a variety of protozoa, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and pneumocystis pneumonia, for example. You get malignancies, you have neuro aids, you get neurological symptoms. And uh, of course, what's happening here is we're depleting T cells, the CD8 cells also go down. Uh, and um, the, all aspects of the immune response are, are dysregulated. And eventually the patient dies of some other infection that you cannot clear, which we could clear any time. Now, again, this is untreated. If you treat uh, with antiretrovirals, you keep the viral load very, very low so you don't develop any of these symptoms. It never progresses. We also see cancers in uh, HIV patients. Uh, we, and about 40% of infected individuals will uh, get some form of cancer. And this is uh, resulting from two effects. First, the, the immune system is being destroyed, right? So immune surveillance is very important for keeping cancers from growing in us. And the other is that the virus is continually multiplying and we're continuously making cytokines to try and get rid of infection. Uh, and cytokines, of course, among other things, cause cells to divide. And you should remember from the transformation and oncogenesis lecture that when cells divide continuously, they sustain mutations and eventually they become transformed and maybe also oncogenic. And so high levels of cytokines uh, and the, we also have viruses in us. All of us have Epstein-Barr, HHV-8, human papillomavirus, or many of us have HPV. Uh, but these are uh, viruses capable of causing cancers. And so they can start to proliferate as well in the immunosuppressive state. Uh, and so a variety of cancers resulting from all of these. So the, the virus itself is not causing the cancer as say for Rouse sarcoma viruses uh, in chickens, but it's an indirect effect of all the uh, activities that are going on here. Uh, one of the cancers was the alert that something unusual is going on, that's Kaposi's sarcoma. And this was an old cancer, it was described in 1872 by a Hungarian physician named Kaposi. And before AIDS, it was mainly seen in older uh, Mediterranean men, presumably who were immunosuppressed for a variety of other reasons. Uh, and then with HIV, we saw much more of it. It occurs in about 20% of HIV-infected men, 2% in women, and transfusion recipients. So 2% in women or people who got AIDS from uh, transfusion developed Kaposi's sarcoma. And what's interesting here is that a second virus is required along with HIV to cause the Kaposi's sarcoma. I should say that the skin lesions are just part of the cancer. You also have tumors uh, inside of you as well. Human herpes virus 8 it has to be present with HIV-1 uh, in order to cause Kaposi's sarcoma. This was actually discovered by two scientists up at the Medical Center uh, of Columbia University, Pat Moore and Yuan Chang. Okay, so uh, this this, necess this necessity for co-infection explains, you know, the low frequency of Kaposi's sarcoma uh, in HIV-infected individuals. At least partly explains it. So here's a summary of the induction of cancers. So we have HIV infection of CD4 cells, so certain, certain um, variants of HIV that arise during long-term infection also can infect macrophages. And so infection of macrophages and CD4 cells lead to the production of cytokines. The cytokines cause reproduction of B cells and together with either EBV or HHV8, Kaposi's sarcoma virus is HHV8, they can cause lymphomas to arise. Right, tumors of uh, B cells. The cytokines can affect endothelial cells, the lining of blood vessels, and again, together with HHV8, cause uh, uh, the formation of Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, and then the cytokines could make uh, epithelial cells proliferate, and that together with human papillomavirus would lead to a carcinoma as well. So it's a summary of what I just told you uh, on the previous slide.
So let's summarize this. We have somewhere in 1921, a chimp virus, SIV, CPZ, goes to patient zero. That was the hunter who initially slaughtered the animal. And by the way, David Quammen has written a book which makes a nice story out of this. Um, and that gives rise to HIV-1, gets into people, 75 million infections so far, 32 million deaths, still ongoing. Really uh, a remarkable story. And at the onset of COVID, most people didn't know we were still in a HIV AIDS pandemic, but we certainly are. SARS-CoV-2, the virus causing the third pandemic of the 21st century. Obviously, HIV AIDS is one. And the other, does anyone know what the other is? You know, what year was that, do you remember? 2009. Yeah, 2009 influenza. So three pandemics of the 21st century. It starts in December of 2019 in Wuhan, China, where there is a cluster of uh, pneumonia cases, unusually severe, and all the diagnostic tests turn up negative for all the known viruses to cause uh, pneumonia. And in fact, as you know, there was an epidemic of SARS-1 in 2002, 2003, which we described last time. And after that, China put in place a surveillance system that would send alerts whenever there were more than a certain number of cases of severe uh, respiratory disease that aren't usually seen. So this, uh, this warning system worked and uh, th these cases were first detected in December uh, of 2019. Uh, there, is, there are four open markets in Wuhan that sell animals that you can buy and have slaughtered and bring home and eat them. And obviously they are a risk factor for zoonotic transmission. That's how it, SARS-1 began from a open meat market as we discussed last time. And of the four, the Huanan Seafood Market, which also sells mammals that are known to be susceptible to infection, was an early epicenter. That means a lot of cases were described around uh, and in the seafood market. So here's a map of Wuhan. Here is the, uh, the Huanan market here. And these uh, dots are uh, all the early cases of uh, these cases of pneumonia, which eventually were diagnosed as being caused by uh, SARS-CoV-2. And just to point out, here's the Wuhan Institute of Virology across the river where they work on coronaviruses and just for that reason have been implicated in playing some role in, in the origin of this, and we'll get back to that later. Now, Wuhan is a transportation center, major transportation center, so the virus was able to rapidly spread globally. I remember teaching this course in January of 2020, and I think I told you this story. I asked if anyone had heard of this new virus outbreak in China, and three people raised their hand, and every class I would put up the dashboard from Johns Hopkins that tracked the number of cases. And slowly the, num the dots multiplied in China, surrounding countries, and then began to spread uh, globally more and more. And at spring break, that was the end of our class. We never came back to class. We did everything online for 2020 and also the summer of uh, 2020. I think spring 2021, we also did it on Zoom. Okay, so um, what is going on here? Um, first, I'm sure you know this, but the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. COVID is not the name of the virus. A lot of people still call it COVID virus, but it's not the COVID virus. COVID is the disease, coronavirus disease 2019. The virus, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus two, um, but, People don't want to get the naming right, so I'm telling you, and there's no reason not to get it right. And just like HIV AIDS, there's a virus and there's the disease. Not really that hard, right? And I tell people that and they get mad. So you, when you tell someone they're wrong, they get mad. That's the first reaction. Oh, but I thought this, no, you don't think anything. It's, this is the way it is. You don't need to be mad if I'm, right, if I'm wrong about something. So, okay, thank you for telling me. I, by the way, someone emailed me, Leuvenhoek was not Dutch, he was Danish. I, he's the guy who made the first microscope, right? So I said, I told you he was Dutch. So someone emailed me 
He said, Professor, he was Danish. I said, you know, I should know better. And you know what he wrote back? He said, that's the best response you could have. Yes, admit your mistakes. I do it all the time. Okay, cases, so far over 676 million, over 6.8 million deaths. These are estimates, right? Because we don't test everyone and not everyone has COVID on the death certificate. So it's likely much more. This is the daily confirmed cases per million people. You can see, you know, starting in March, we had increasing uh, numbers of people infected and it got bigger and bigger. In fact, each of these peaks or waves is caused by a different variant that subsequently emerged that you've heard about, uh, Alpha and Delta and Beta and, and uh, Omicron more recently. And the, the biggest peaks there are the, the Omicrons. Uh, which uh, spread very, uh, very extensively. So th I only have a few countries here. We have France, which has the biggest peak there in, in March 2022, Canada, UK, uh, Germany, India, and the US. I just wanted to give you a representation of uh, what is going on here. And obviously infections continue to this day because the vaccines don't prevent infection, but we're testing less and less. So we really don't have a good idea of uh, the situation. Uh, there are probably many more than this. All right, so coronaviruses, you should know already, are enveloped viruses uh, with a plus-stranded RNA genome. They're called coronaviruses, uh, not after the beer, okay? Not after the place in Queens. You know, there's a, and they had the highest seropositivity for a while early in the outbreak, Corona Queens. I thought that was interesting. No, because when they first saw them in, in the electron microscope, it looked, the halo of spikes around the particle looked like a solar corona. Let's call these coronaviruses. It's about 100 nanometer in diameter. Uh, the plus-stranded RNA is, is complex with a protein, and so we call it a nucleocapsid. And there's, a, there are several proteins in the membrane, but the, the one that we're gonna talk about the most is the spike protein, of course, uh, which Many, many people globally now know Spike. I have a, I have a Spike t-shirt. And if I say to someone, this is Spike, they'll go, oh yeah, I know what that is. Never would have happened before. That genome is 30,000 bases of plus-stranded RNA, really big. And um, it's divided into a variety of open reading frames. So ORF1 uh, <clears throat> on the left uh, encodes the proteins that are needed to reproduce uh, the viral RNA, like the RNA polymerase, the error correction protein, the helicase, uh, and so forth. Uh, there are also proteases encoded uh, in that genome to process uh, that um, polyprotein. And there, there are two long open reading frames on the left hand, ORF1A uh, and uh, ORF1B. And then on the right, there's a third, which encodes the structural proteins like the spike, uh, the E and the M are two other uh, proteins in the membrane, and then the nucleocapsid protein there on the right. The way the, these viruses enter cells, the, the coronaviruses, the human coronaviruses, which are shown at the right there, uh, interact with a variety of uh, human plasma membrane proteins. SARS-CoV-2, the receptor is ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. ACE2 is also the receptor for SARS-CoV-1 and for a common cold coronavirus called NL63. But you can see other coronaviruses bind to different receptors. We have human aminopeptidase N, N-acetyl, N-acetyl 9O, acetylneuraminic acid, uh, dipeptidyl peptidase 4. But for SARS-CoV-2, the virus binds ACE2 at the cell surface. And as we talked about during the entry, if there's a particular protease on the cell surface called Tempres 2, uh, that Tempres will cleave the spike and the virus will fuse at the cell surface. If there's no Tempres 2 on the cell, the virus is taken up by endocytosis and gets out from the endosome. But in the respiratory tract, the main target of SARS-CoV-2 entry occurs at the plasma membrane. The viral RNA ends up in the cytoplasm. It's plus-stranded, of course, so it can engage ribosomes. You have 1A and 1AB open reading frames made. Uh, those are processed 
to give rise to individual proteins by proteases that are encoded in them. And among those proteins are some that induce double membrane vesicles, and that's where RNA synthesis occurs. And the RNA, of course, goes through negative strand intermediates. We have the production of mRNAs and, of course, new genomes. The uh, new genomes come together with nucleocapsid protein to form the nucleocapsid. That structure buds into the ergic, the ER uh, Golgi intermediate compartment. So it's a membrane compartment between the ER and the Golgi. So the nucleocapsid buds into it and acquires the membrane. So this, this, all the viral glycoproteins have been inserted into the ergic membrane, including spike. And now we have a new virus in a smooth walled vessel, which travels to the plasma membrane, fuses, and that's how the virus particles are released. So these don't bud at, this, at the surface, these particles. They bud into uh, the ergic. Okay, as far as disease goes, you inhale droplets containing this virus into the nasopharynx. So the upper respiratory tract, you, the virus goes into the nose. And, and the, in the nasopharynx, the epithelial cells lining the nasopharynx, they have ACE2, they have TEMPRAS2. That's where the virus initially reproduces. And in many people, it causes mainly an upper respiratory tract disease. Uh, and in some people, the virus travels down into uh, the lower parts of the respiratory tract and causes more severe uh, disease in the form of, of pneumonia, hence the name of the virus. Now, you, when, when virus is in the respiratory tract, the mucus traps it and you end up swallowing a lot of that mucus. And even if the virus goes down into your lung, we have a mucociliary elevator. You have to push floor 13 to get to, back to the mouth and then you swallow that. And that's why we find viral RNA in, in feces. And I don't see any convincing evidence that it's reproducing in the gut. I think you were just swallowing it, but it's a good marker because then we can find it in sewage and in, in wastewater, right? It's a good marker for uh, infection, which was done here, by the way, at Columbia. Um, uh, early on, a, a number of, uh, what's the guy's name? Barnard professor who teaches microbiology. You know him? Yeah. He got students to sample the, the water coming out of the toilets and was able to see the virus before there was an outbreak in the dorms. Miranda, right. many places have done that since. So that's the source of that virus. Um, it's, you can also find it in the blood because you know, the, the virus is reproducing to high levels. It's going to get uh, to a certain extent into subepithelial tissues and it makes its way into the blood. But I, I don't think the, the blood virus is enough to deliver it to any particular organ. Anyway, that's the early entry. And, and we, we have also seen this, this slide before, but I think it's worth repeating. This is shedding and transmissibility. So on this uh, figure, we're looking at uh, the, um, the incubation period uh, and then the period of shedding. So incubation period is blue, and then this, the symptomatic period, sorry, not shedding, the symptomatic period is this pur purple color. So symptoms, when you feel something, right? So for SARS-1, uh, you started to shed uh, during the symptomatic period here, but the peak of shedding was at the peak of disease, and that's mostly when you were hospitalized. So it was relatively easy to contain these patients by infection control in hospitals, so it didn't spread very well. We didn't have community spread because uh, there was really no pre-symptomatic uh, shedding. Now, it's different for SARS-CoV-2. We have an incubation period here uh, during which we're shedding quite a bit. So before symptoms, we're shedding a lot. Then we have the onset of symptoms. And then at that point, the titers begin to decline. So extensive shed during the incubation period and also from people who never develop symptoms, what we call asymptomatic uh, infections. And so this is called community transmission which happened with SARS-CoV-2, but not SARS-1. And that's how a virus spreads very effectively because people f feel fine and they're out and about transmitting infection to others. So this is a graph uh, from my colleague, Daniel Griffin, who, which shows the different stages of COVID. So here we have exposure, TE, and then this dark line is viral RNA measured by RT-PCR. So you can see there's a, this is the incubation period, uh, two to 14 days before you feel symptoms. So that's the symptom phase, first week of infection. You can see 
that there's shedding in the incubation period. The peak of shedding occurs at about the onset of symptoms. Then you have that one week of uh, the viral phase, and then the titers are going down during that week. So when you first feel your, your symptoms, your titers are starting to decline. And so if you want to take an antiviral, you need to take it during this viral phase because in the next phase, the inflammatory period, we have very little viral uh, replication. But the symptoms during this period, and these are the severe cases of pneumonia and uh, other um, inflammatory diseases, are all driven by the immune response, an overreactive immune response. Uh, and here is where um, the infection can get very serious. So many people uh, just experience this first phase and recover. So here's another view of the phases according to age and severity. And so less than 50 years of age, including less than 10 years of age, you may have an asymptomatic infection, mild disease, about 80% fall into this category. If you're over 60, you're likely to have severe disease involving dyspnea, uh, and you need to go to the ICU because you can't breathe. And if you're over 68, uh, you're likely to proceed to acute respiratory distress, cardiac injury, multi-organ failure. That's about 5%, maybe less now. This is an early slide. Uh, and the, these are in, in likely to happen in, in older people. And we talked about the risk factors for this severe disease. One, age is the big one, and also making uh, antibodies against uh, your interferons. Now, as the virus multiplied more and more in people, we began to see the evolution of what we call variants, viruses with a lot of changes in the genome. When initially, when there wasn't so much replication, we didn't see so many changes in the genome. But once it got into millions and millions, we saw lots. And this is the kind of data that were collected. Uh, many people were doing genome sequences of isolates. We now have millions and millions of full genome sequences from many people in many countries, as you can see here. And this is a graph showing you sequences by variant. And so this is the last two weeks, the percent of each variant in each country. So here, this is the Delta variant in, in this cyan color here. And you can see in some countries it was already at 100% when uh, I took this graph from just say that from our world and data. And uh, in some, like Brazil only had 23% Delta, they had 77% of Gamma. And you can see other variants circulating. Eventually, Delta, of course, replaced everything. And then Omicron replaced Delta. And now subvariants of Omicron are doing the same thing. Now, I've already told you before my thoughts about this. Um, many people concluded that these variants were more transmissible, more uh, virulent, or less virulent. But the reason they displace a previous virus is because they're more fit. You have selection of the fittest variants. What's, what is selected for? A lot of things could be selected for. The, the level of virus reproduction in the tract, immune evasion, even intrinsic transmissibility, the ability of the virus to, say, retain infectivity in droplets so that it more effectively goes to someone else. Nobody's done the right experiments to prove any of those for any variant. You can't make a conclusion about, say, intrinsic and uh, transmissibility unless you do transmission studies. Uh, for sure, the Omicron variants are immune evasive. They're resistant to antibodies, and that accounts for their ability to spread and displace previous variants. Uh, so, but, uh, but it all falls under improved fitness. And so there are many ways a virus can be more fit, and maybe someday we'll sort it out for many of these uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants. We do the same kind of variant tracking for influenza viruses. So uh, influenza viruses, have we talked about, uh, undergo antigenic drift, which means multiple amino acid changes in the hemagglutinin, among other things. And we track them because we may have to change the vaccine if those changes occur in an important epitope. And so here's a graph from April 2018 to October uh, 2020 showing you the different variants that are predominating at different times. So on the top is SARS-CoV-2. You can see 
you know, 19 A and B are predominant, then they're replaced at some point by other variants and so on and so forth, as I've just told you. The same thing happens for influenza virus. So we're tracking variant replacement of H3N2, H1N1, and a B influenza B virus. And these dynamics occur because the viruses are immune evasive. And the new immune evasive gets in the population and can infect people who have already been infected. So you have new waves of infected. In the influenza virus field, nobody ever says that they're more transmissible. They just say they're immune evasive. And I don't understand why with COVID we started calling them more transmissible. The only word that would describe all of them were, as I said, it's, it's fitness and immune evasion. But anyway, that's, that is my take on, on the variant situation. The only, in my view, the only important information about a variant coming from the sequence is whether it's resistant to monoclonals or not, because you don't want to use a monoclonal that's not going to work uh, on a variant. But to say that, you know, Delta is more transmissible, so you better stay home, is the absolute absurdity. It's just nonsense because you have no idea. It may be infecting more people because it's immune evasive or fit for other reasons. Now, we have been very fortunate that we've developed uh, many vaccines and, and multiple therapeutics for SARS-CoV-2 in record time. It took 50 years to develop the first polio vaccine. We still don't have an HIV vaccine. But within a year, we had multiple SARS-CoV-2 vaccines because uh, it was the, the nature of the problem was recognized, and so we put a lot of work into it. So here uh, we have a schema. This is from a while ago, but I just want to use it to, sh to illustrate. At that point in December 21, we had 276 vaccines in development, 20, 24 in use already. And of course, in the U.S., uh, we have licensed the, the BioNTech and Moderna mRNA vaccines. We have also used a... Uh, to a lesser extent, adenovirus uh, vectored vaccines from Oxford and Janssen. Uh, more recently, a protein spike vaccine has been uh, given at EUA for, from Novavax. And then these are some of the uh, leading vaccines from other countries. Uh, in China, by the way, they, they have uh, used inactivated vaccines, and they have also used uh, vaccines vectored in adenovirus type 5. We're going to talk about vectors on the last lecture of this course. Turns out that m most of the population has antibodies to adenovirus type 5. It's not a good choice for a, v a vector. Um, the Oxford vaccine uses chimp adenovirus, which none of us have antibodies to. So they are now remaking this. They're, they're making mRNA vaccines of their own. They didn't want to buy ours. So they used suboptimal vaccines and now uh, have made their own. Uh, anyway, these vaccines, uh, as you know, have been very effective. They have to be given in multiple doses. We initially gave the mRNA vaccines three or four weeks apart. That's too close to allow affinity maturation to occur. You're, in, you're interrupting it by giving that second dose. You have the, in the lymph nodes, the B cells are undergoing affinity maturation. Then some new antigen comes in, it distracts them, and they start responding to that. So we ended up giving a, dose, a third dose months later which now gave us really good affinity maturation. And the mRNA vaccines and many others are based on <clears throat> a prefusion version of the spike. So when the spike is cleaved by Tempris 2, it unfolds into a fusogenic form, but the epitopes in the fusogenic form are not the right ones for neutralization. And so a couple of prolines have been added to the C-terminus of S2 just before the fusion peptide to keep the spike protein in its native prefusion conformation where all the neutralizing epitopes are present. Really, really important development. So the mRNA vaccines, of course, are wrapped up in a lipid nanoparticle. It's an mRNA encoding the spike protein, prefusion, two prolines so it doesn't uh, get cleaved. It's injected into the muscle. The, uh, the, the nanoparticles, of course, are picked up by APCs like uh, dendritic cells and macrophages. They go in the lymph node. Uh, in the lymph node, the uh, APCs translate the mRNA. They produce the protein. They display it on their cell surface. They present it to T cells. And of course, the T cells then recognize it as foreign, begin to multiply and get activated and initiate an adaptive response. And as you know, the, the mRNA vaccines are very effective uh, at preventing uh, disease. 
Now here's an example of a headline which is based on a misunderstanding of the immune system. This is from Forbes. The US is in a fifth wave. Immunity is waning. Why can't we all have second boosters? Well, what's not said in the article is that efficacy against severe COVID remains high. No vaccine prevents infection. And th this headline suggests that we should be. And yeah, immunity is, goes down, as I've told you. But this kind of reporting impacts vaccine uptake. People say, why should I bother getting vaccinated? Vaccinated, it doesn't work. Well, in fact, it does work. And remember, you get those boosters or you get an infection, you make a, a antibody or a T cell response, and then you have memory. And when you get infected, the virus will begin to reproduce until the memory response kicks in, which is a couple of days. So yeah, three months after vaccination, you're gonna get infected. That's how the vaccine works. No vaccine prevents infection, unless you do it in the first three months after immunization when antibodies and T cells are high. Yet to this day, we still have headlines saying, can we make a vaccine that prevents infection? To which I say, good luck. Don't waste too much money because it's our immune system. That's the way it works. So the, the vaccines are actually tested to prevent disease, not infection, and they worked really well for that. And as I said, most human vaccines don't prevent infection, they prevent disease. Um, and uh, to this day, if you have three doses, even of the original spike, not Omicron, you are protected against severe disease, unless you're old or have comorbidities, in which case I would say you should just take an antiviral if you test positive. Don't keep getting boosted because that's not a public health strategy. If you don't believe me, listen to a vaccinologist, Paul Offit. The goal of the COVID vaccine is to prevent serious illness. A, a booster prevents infection for a few months, but to last longer, another booster is required. This is not a reasonable public health strategy to boost frequently. Let's learn to accept that the goal of vaccines is to prevent severe and not mild illness and stop talking about boosting, otherwise we will never be able to live our lives as before. As you know from our antiviral uh, lecture, we have a number of antivirals, a protease inhibitor, and uh, two nucleoside chain terminators and mutagens. We have also used in the past convalescent plasma and monoclonal uh, antibodies. Now finally, where did this virus come from? Every other coronavirus came from animals, Every other virus came from animals to humans. These are the common cold coronaviruses, SARS-1, MERS, even a pig coronavirus, all came from some animal, in some cases in an intermediate into humans. So what's the story with SARS-CoV-2? Well, unfortunately, um, politics have invaded this discussion. Um, and here's a headline uh, accompanying the, the Department of Energy's report, released a couple of weeks ago said, lab leak is the most likely origin. Well, first of all, the virus was not made in the lab. Nobody had a virus close enough to SARS-CoV-2 to be able to make it, and it didn't escape. Nobody had it in a lab. The only candidate in Wuhan, Zhang Li Shi, who, who I've emailed said, we didn't have it. In fact, she published all the bat coronavirus sequences she had. None of them were SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, most of them are just sequences. They're not even viruses. So. I don't know what the DOE has got here. They don't have anything in my opinion, but you're gonna hear a lot about this because the House is now gonna have an investigation. They're interviewing some of the virologists that I know. I can't wait to hear Marjorie Taylor in interview uh, three virologists who said it came from nature. It's a zoonotic virus like every other human virus, and there are close relatives of SARS-CoV-2 circulating in, child, in Laos and other uh, Southern Asian countries. The market was the epicenter. Probably the spillovers occurred there, but the market was sanitized on January 1st, so the animals were disposed of and the area was clean, so it's very hard to get good data about uh, what was there. Uh, this is a map of the, the market, and you can see here the, the animals were kept in cages, stacked on one another, so it's easy for them to shed virus and have it fall down below. And um, th this part of the market, the west side contained the mammals, the, the east side contained other things. And these colored areas are uh, areas that are environmentally positive for SARS-CoV-2. So they do swabs and they find SARS-CoV-2 
uh, positive materials. And most of the positives are around the area where the, ma the mammals are kept that were uh, susceptible to infection. And a lot of these environmentally positive areas, positive for SARS-CoV-2, were subsequently found to contain mitochondrial DNA indicating the species that were mixed with it, and many of them were raccoon dogs. There is one set of samples which had only raccoon dog DNA and SARS-CoV-2 DNA from RT-PCR and no human DNA. So all of this evidence is in support of it originating here. Now, many people say that this furin cleavage site, uh, which is present in the spike glycoprotein, uh, is a marker of human manipulation, okay? But if you just look at the site and think about it a little, you see that's not the case. The first thing they said, well, it's, it's not present in any relatives of SARS-CoV-2, but we barely have any of these sampled. We do see the, the furin cleavage site, which is here, FCS, in uh, other coronas, including common cold coronaviruses. And by the way, it's a suboptimal site, and it's caused by an in-frame, an out-of-frame insertion here. No postdoc would ever put a furin cleavage site in this way. It would be the dumbest way, a, a suboptimal site, out of frame. If I had someone come to me, say, Professor, I want to do this, I'd say, what are you, out of your mind? Just do it more simply. There's no way somebody made this. And then someone else has said, oh, look at these two adjacent CGG codons. That's, that's not going to last. That's clearly put in there by a human. Well, we have over... 2.3 million genome sequences, and 99.8% of them, 0.8% of them still have that G, CGG, CGG. So obviously there's a functional reason why it is kept there. Here are some, uh, here's a phylogenetic tree of SARS-CoV-2 viruses from the earliest uh, sampling in 2020. And the closest virus at the time of this paper was the bat coronavirus, RITG13. 96% nucleotide identity. It's about 1,200 bases different. There's no way anyone could have engineered that because 1,200 bases would be a lot to change, and why would they do it anyway? That's about 10 years of, of evolution. Subsequently, a more, more similar viruses have been found in Laos. SARS-CoV-2 viruses from four different sampling sites in Laos. Actually, it's pronounced Lao, okay? I, I always forget to do that. And these banal viruses, uh, banal doesn't mean they're boring. It means that they're from bat anal swabs. These are even closer to SARS-CoV-2. So clearly very close viruses are circulating in nature. And somehow one idea is that they got into the market and spilled over uh, into humans. So here's a, a quote from a paper on, on trying to summarize the origin of SARS-CoV-2. The lab accident conduit is highly unlikely relative to the numerous and repeated human-animal contacts that occur routinely in the wildlife trade. <clears throat> Failure to investigate the zoonotic origin through collaborative and carefully coordinated studies would leave the world vulnerable to future pandemics arising from the same activities that have repeatedly put us on a collision course with novel viruses. So I think it's important to understand where the virus came from to try and prevent it happening again. So my last slide for today, what's the future? The virus is with us forever. We'll never eradicate it because many wild animals have already been infected, but more and more of the population will become infected and vaccinated early in life. The older individuals who are at risk will eventually move on, and then we will have a new generation of individuals growing up already have been infected at a young age. They will have memory to infection. They will have mild disease that will be boosted probably every year uh, by another infection. So SARS-CoV-2 will be the fifth common cold coronavirus. All right, on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about unusual infectious agents. And after that lecture, you will never eat beef again. <laughs>